Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God, our Heavenly Father, through His Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Dear disciples of Jesus, many years ago when I was in college, we asked one of our professors what he believed was the book of the Bible or the author in the Bible that, that uh, recorded some of the most difficult teachings or sayings in the Bible. And we were thinking... Perhaps he would say Revelation or maybe something like Leviticus or something like that. And he came back and said, oh, without question, it's the Gospels. He said, the words of Jesus are by far the most difficult to understand and to grasp. And I, I remember thinking at the time, I think he's messing with us. Um, and, and certainly there has to be more to that. But he said nothing more on it. And... Eh, probably 30 and a half decade, three and a half decades later, I've come to learn that he wasn't putting us on at all. He was being just very honest with us. <laughs> the words of Jesus in the Gospels are the most difficult in all of Scripture. And that's because Jesus tells us things we don't like to hear. Jesus confronts us and our thoughts and our attitudes and our opinions and our long-held beliefs. He challenges us in ways that you probably can't even imagine. He says things often that don't even appear to have anything to do with what he was asked. One sentence may not even appear to, to, to have anything to do with what he's just said in the previous sentence, and yet you know somehow it must fit together and you're still trying to figure out how. Reading Jesus, understanding Jesus is a challenge. And if you're not wrestling with the words of Jesus, if they're not posing a challenge to you, then I might humbly suggest that you are not reading and applying the words of Jesus very well. That's simply true. So, if you're not already struggling with the words of Jesus, then today I'm going to challenge you and beg you to pick up the Bible and start reading in the Gospels, the teachings of Jesus. Because as his disciples, that's what Jesus calls you to do. He calls you, come follow me, captivated by my teaching. So why does Jesus do this? And why, why does it have to be such a struggle? It's because Jesus wants to draw us closer and closer to himself. Because not because he's a narcissist, but because he knows that he is our only Savior. He knows that he is our only righteousness, our only forgiveness, our only resurrection, our only life, our only truth, and our only way. So he then exposes every wrong opinion, idea, intention, or motive fueled by our sinful nature and the world around us whose winds are constantly blowing the prevailing winds of the world and our sinful nature is always blowing us away from Jesus so let's listen to what St. Mark tells us this morning in the first chapter of his gospel beginning at verse 21 this is what we read they Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Mark tells us that the people were captivated by what? Not by what we might think, not by miracles, by his teaching. And then he tells us why. Because Jesus taught with authority. So, not with the authority of other people or other commentators. Jesus taught with his own authority. He, he didn't quote the, this what this rabbi thought and maybe this is what that rabbi thought and here are some of the traditions that we followed and and here are some of the things that we do based on our traditions. In fact, many times when Jesus taught with authority, he condemned the commentaries and their traditions 
that had been handed down to them. And the people in this, in this lesson here in the synagogue in Capernaum sat up and took notice. This was radically different from anything else they had heard before. So but how could Jesus do this? Well, it goes to the heart of who Jesus is. He is the Lord God of the Old Testament and especially of the Old Testament Scripture. So who better than Jesus would have known why God said what God said when God said it to the people in the Old Testament? Better than anybody in his audience in Capernaum or any then time after, Jesus knew the context of those words. He knew the hearts and attitudes that he was addressing in the Old Testament. And so he didn't have to quote rabbis and what they thought about a situation. Jesus could tell them with authority that what God said, God meant. And he didn't equivocate. He didn't hem and haw. He proclaimed God's word boldly. Now, that kind of is a sad commentary uh, on the preaching and teaching that had gone on in the synagogues, perhaps for a few hundred years already. Yes, the scriptures were read every Sabbath, and, and that's as good often as it ever got. In fact, uh, St. Paul tells us that very often then in those synagogues, a veil would cover the people's hearts. And what was that veil? It was the veil of their own understanding. See, they, the rabbis would get up after the reading, and then they would com comment on that reading, and they would share commentary from what some rabbi thought on one side of it, and then maybe what another rabbi said on a different side of it. And so it always gave the impression that you could never be sure of what God's word, what God was saying and what God meant. But you know what they were sure of? They were sure of the human traditions that had been passed down to them. So about God's word, they were uncertain. But about the traditions of men and the practices that they taught you had to, to follow through with, Oh, no, of that they were absolutely certain. So you can see that Jesus' teaching was far different from anything they had ever heard before. Of course, then, the people weren't the only ones who took notice. The demons also took notice of this. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. So the demons noticed Jesus, but Jesus then put the demons on notice. The demons, interestingly enough, recognize what so many of the followers, the people, and even his own disciples were slow to realize and what the, what the enemies or the teachers refused to recognize, and that is who Jesus is. They, they knew exactly who he was. Jesus, you're the Holy One of God. Now you'd think, well, why would Jesus silence them? They're finally telling the truth. These devils, these liars, huh? But you see, even the truth in the mouths of liars becomes a lie and Jesus would not allow that and so he with his word he silences the demon and orders it out of this the man who had been possessed by it and 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 what's the what's the reaction to that well well the people notice this they notice that they just heard a message as from one teaching with authority and now with the same words He's able to command demons and get them to do what he wants them to do. So what happens is, well, the people were all amazed, Mark said. Then they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Again, I want you to notice in Mark's account, it, it is uh, what captivates the people. What captivates them is Jesus' word, his teaching. We might have thought Mark would have said, oh, they were captivated because Jesus threw a demon out of somebody. That's not what it says. They were captivated by his word. And why? Because Jesus spoke with authority. 
And then he demonstrated the power and authority of his word by speaking to a demon. And even the demon, something that no human could, could fight against, this one, this Jesus, was able to command, and the demon had to obey. Wow. They were amazed at the power and authority of this man's word. When you hear Jesus' words, when you meditate on his teachings, his power and his authority are undeniable. See, they, those words of Jesus will work on your heart and your mind like nothing else. They will captivate you, yes, but they will challenge you. They, they will call you to action. And this holds some very grave implications for us, brothers and sisters. Because when you open your Bibles at home to read them, when you come to worship to hear and study His Word, it is Jesus who is speaking to you. These are His words, and they come to you with His power and authority. And yes, He will call you out for your sins. He will expose what you are maybe trying to keep hidden. He will make you uncomfortable in your sinful condition, in your sinful opinions, thoughts, and commonly held beliefs. He will demand that you repent of them, that you turn away from them, and that you give soul attention to Him and put all faith in what He tells you. But Jesus is also going to speak His love into your hearts with His promises and His assurances. He will speak His righteousness and His forgiveness to you, His life. He will address the demons that are haunting you. And He will silence them. He will, he will address and confront the lies that we so commonly either hear and believe or even make up ourselves and believe. The lies that cause us all kinds of anxiety, emotionally, spiritually. And He will silence them. He will silence them because His Word has power and authority. And how do you know that's true? Because anytime Jesus speaks to you, He leads you. He's leading you to his ministry. He's leading you to follow him to see in his ministry your righteousness. He, he's leading you with him to the place where he suffered. He's leading you to the cross where with his great power and authority he washed away your sins and canceled your guilt and shame and destroyed the works of the devil that were against you. He leads you to his empty to, or to, excuse me, to his grave, and from there he leads you out of his empty tomb where he is alive, assuring you that all of this is true. This is the one who speaks to you, the one who has power over sin, over devil, over the grave. His words are captivating always and forever. So, friend, I guess the question is, what captivates you? Are you truly captivated by the words and the teachings of Jesus? Or do you find other things a bit more captivating? Is it, is it the Bible you run to in the morning? Or, or is it the phone to pick up and flip through the latest... Uh, you know, social media feeds. And in the afternoon and the evening, is it the Bible that's sitting there on the, on the stand next to your chair? Or, or is it the remote so you can pick that up and check out the latest sport or sports game or, or, or the latest TV show? And if you do reach for a book on your, on your nightstand, or maybe it's probably in your living room next to your chair, does it say Holy Bible or does it say New York Times bestseller? What captivates you? Sin is always at work. The winds of this world, the prevailing winds, are always blowing, and they're always blowing us away from Jesus. They're always captivating us, tugging at us. But brothers and sisters, as disciples of Jesus, this should not be. 
You know, we cannot claim to be disciples of Jesus and yet then follow the siren calls of the world around us. We can't be going one way and heading in the opposite direction at the same time. And, and so what's Jesus calling us to do? Repent. Simply repent. Close your ears to those siren calls. Turn away from them. And turn back to embrace your Savior. Turn away from what the world passes off as, as entertainment or wisdom and turn back to what truly is the wisdom and power of your God. If you're looking for signs, then look to His Word. Because God's Word is the sign of His power and authority. Nothing can or will ever touch your heart like the words and promises of Jesus. Listen to it intently. Take his word to heart. Let it challenge you. Let it get it let it question you. Why it may even lead you to question him at times. Let it continue to captivate and challenge you. More often let it question you and your motives and your commonly held beliefs. As I said earlier, if you're not already engaged in reading a, a particular book of the Bible, then I'm challenging you today to find that Bible wherever it is in your house and put it next to that stand next to your easy chair, whatever it is you do you the most sitting or relaxing. And I'm going to suggest that you open up to one of the Gospels. Now, I'd suggest Mark or Luke. Mark because it's a little shorter, more concise. Luke because I think you'd be familiar with most of the accounts there. But begin reading just little sections. Not whole chapters, not, not bunches of chapters at a time, just little sections. And your English translations are all broken up nicely into little accounts so you can see where, they're, where one ends and the other begins. Sometimes they're so short you'll be able to get two or three, but just a section at a time. And as you do that, I want you to ask Jesus some questions. See, he's going to talk to you. But I want you to ask Jesus some questions. So, if you want to get out your phones and take pictures of these questions, you're going to get a pen you want to get out real quick and write them down, I'll, I'll give you time to do that. But these are questions I want you to ask Jesus as you study His Word. So you've read a little section in the Gospels. Then, it was, then you say, Jesus, what are you telling me here? See, what do you want me to know? to trust, or to put into practice. That's how we begin meditating and thinking about what Jesus is saying. Not, Jesus, what were you telling those people back then? No, 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 Jesus, what are you telling me? I'm now in your audience. What do you want me to know? What do you want me to trust or to put into practice? Secondly, what sinful motive thought, opinion, or behavior are you exposing and want me to repent of and correct? When you're reading through the Gospels and you're listening to the words of Jesus, you will find very often he is exposing sin. And if he's exposing sin in others, he's exposing sin in our hearts. So ask yourself, Jesus, or ask Jesus, what sinful motive, thought, opinion, behavior are you exposing and want me to repent of and correct? Okay? Third, Jesus, where in these words are you showing me your mercy and grace by which you draw me closer to you? Because Jesus always does that. He always is pulling you closer to him. If you don't see that, read it again. Jesus is somewhere showing you his mercy and his grace. Sometimes it's just in the fact that he's talking to you. Right? He's showing you his mercy and his grace. 
And finally then, last question, Jesus, how shall I direct my prayers today in response to your word? Repentance, thanksgiving, praise, intercession, a particular petition, or maybe any and all of the above. And, and I'm going to suggest that if you're just taking mental notes for yourself, or if you're just scribbling on a, on a piece of paper or napkin next to you when you're meditating on God's Word, when you're finished answering these questions, asking these questions and finding Jesus' answers in His Word, why, your prayer will already be written for you. It'll be no hard, it, no, nothing difficult at all to have a prayer right there with the thoughts that Jesus has already shared with you. It's only through this exercise of daily Bible reading and studying, meditation, thinking, and prayer that the Holy Spirit of God is going to draw you closer to Jesus. He's going to strengthen your love and your faith in Jesus as well as increase your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of Jesus' Word. And what will that do for you? Well, sure, it'll bring you closer to Jesus, but it will also make you an even more faithful witness Jesus. Many years ago, I want to say it was probably three decades ago, um, a friend of mine talked, was sharing a little something he had heard from a friend of his, uh, who happened to be a mutual friend, that the man was always complaining about his pastor. He said, oh, the pastor doesn't have a good sermon. His sermons are always boring. His Bible study doesn't do anything for me. I'm not getting anything out of any of it. And uh, a, a mutual friend of theirs then invited this man to a midweek Bible study. They were having an in-home Bible study, and I, I, memory serves me correctly, I think they were studying through the book of Daniel. And it was after several weeks of you know studying through the book of Daniel that the man came back to my friend, and he said with tongue-in-cheek, you know what, I think our pastor has been doing the same Bible study that we've been studying because I've noticed something. His sermons have gotten a lot better and his Bible studies are far more interesting. Disciples of Jesus, grow. Grow to love him more and more as you wrestle with his words. Commit yourselves to the struggle. Eternal treasures await. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we confess that you, you and expose it, and you expose it in our, in our hearts and lives as well, that we are far too often captivated by the siren calls of the world around us. It's so distracting. But we're asking through your word today that, that you would increase our love for you just enough so that we become a little bit more captivated by your word. Just enough so that we will go and do the things that you've called us to do, and that is to study your word. Just a little bit every day. Because we know that by the power and authority you have in your word, you will continue to pull us with a power far greater than the one the world exercises on us. Lord Jesus, more and more, make us captivated by your word and teaching so that we can be your faithful witnesses. In your name we ask it. Amen.